So talking about PET-CT in indeterminate pulmonary nodules, this is, I think, the very daunting task when you are reporting a PET. You may report you can identify the nodule and you can say that this is a nodule and this is where it is, and that's it. It's showing uptake or not, and then you put a full stop, and then that's it. But it doesn't stop there. I think being a now everybody is now imaging doctor rather than a nuclear physician or a radiologist because you have started reporting a PET and the PET basically involves CT and uh, nuclear medicine. So you can't say that I am not going to report, I am not going to characterize a lesion. So the characterizing of the lesion is very important. Any Dick and Harry can look at it at a PET and say oh this is a hot spot in ABC and then full stop, conclude, send the uh, report. But to be a very good uh, imaging doctor, you need to say this is a hotspot, and this is what I think, and this is what the characteristic appearances are, and this is what my diagnosis is. I may be wrong, but you are putting your neck in, and you are coming up and saying that this is what I think, but I'm not absolutely 100% sure because you are not a histopathologist. You cannot give a histological diagnosis. You can just give a radiological diagnosis. So this is basically lung cancer, looking at uh, CT protocol, looking at indeterminate lung nodules, lung cancer staging, monitoring therapy, restaging, and radiotherapy planning. So lung cancer is the leading cause of death in Western world, 39,000 new cases per year, 35,000 die every year, 5.5% are cured, and global epidemic is approximately 3 million deaths annually, and 90% are associated with tobacco use. Histologically type is non-small cell is 80%, squamous cell adenocarcinoma and large cell and small cell accounts for about 20%. So majority of them are non-small cell cancer. Recommendation for follow-up small nodules detected incidentally on PET-CT, patient greater than 35 years of age. So this is very important and you, I would advise that if you are reporting you should know this. So looking at a nodule which is 4 millimeters low risk patient, so you don't, you look at the history, the patient doesn't smoke, he doesn't take anything, you know, which could hamper with his uh, lung functions. So there is no pre-risk of developing cancer, so no follow-up is needed. High risk patient, CT at 12 months. If stable, no further follow-up is needed. So the size is the criteria. So four millimeters, now you come to four to six millimeters. Now you've got a low risk, but you've got a nodule which is five or six millimeters. So you do a CT at 12 months. If stable, no further follow up. So this comes down to here. And initial, if it's high risk, CT at six to 12 months. If stable, repeat CT at 18, 24 months. So now if you've got a five millimeter nodule, you think it's benign, but there is a risk. Even at low risk, you repeat the scan in 12 months because the doubling time will tell you whether this is a tumor or not. And in high risk, you repeat the scan in 6-12 months. If stable, repeat CT in 1824. If the nodule is greater than 6 to 8 millimeters, low risk, initial CT at 6 to 12, and if stable, repeat CT at 1824. So this comes down to this. And initial CT at 3 to 6 months, and if stable, repeat CT at 9 to 12 months, and repeat 24 months. So this, if it goes above 5 to 6 uh, millimeters, so this becomes very crucial if the patient is smoker and there is asbestos sources or there are nodules which are not very benign looking then they need a three to six months stable repeat at 9-12 and then follow them up to 12 months. 
And if it is 8 millimeters, CT at 3, 9, 24 months and consider PET or biopsy. And CT at 3, 9, 24 months, consider PET or biopsy in high risk patient. There is no change in size. No change in size. Marginal change, so there is, you need to take into account of the uh, error. Uh, so if you measure a, a nodule, how you measure it, yes. and then I measure it, there will be few millimeters or very slight point, one millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeters difference sometimes. But uh, if it is stable, then you don't need to follow them up. I think this is very important here. So if there is a risk and you think there is suspicion, you bring the patient in three months' time and you repeat because then that will reflect the doubling time of the lesion. The algorithm calculate the probability of cancer, low, moderate, high, and then if the patient is fit for surgery, you do wet and frozen section, lobectomy, and if malignant, and if there is moderate and not fit for surgery, additional testing, PET, CT, if greater than one centimeter, CT guided biopsy, and low probability CLCT at 3924 months. High risk, and the patient is fit, and the uh, normally, see, the if you see a nodule or a mass or a lesion in the lung, it has got characteristic appearance. If that fits in and you have got a high risk patient, then they go in for surgery. Um, the CT protocol which is being used would be a non contraction and CT? This is, uh, yes, this is for uh, uh, FDG PET, yeah. We'll go, we'll go through the, so uh, the uh, characteristic appearance of uh, the nodules, they describe them as a well-defined nodule. The size is the criteria, but if it is ill-defined, speculated, uh, it raises your suspicion and then you suspect that this could be a malignant. If it is a solitary nodule, which is small, that's why we start using PET. We evaluate them and it improves their sensitivity of diagnosing whether this is malignant or not. If they, the radiologist look at the nodule and say it's speculated, it's a nodule which is ill-defined, and we think that this is a cancer, but we are not sure, and the patient has got a background history of uh, COPD, and they are scared of putting a needle in, because if they put a needle in and patient gets pneumothorax, then there is a chance that patient may not be able to survive because the lung compliance are so bad in COPD patients that they will not be able to tolerate a minor pneumothorax. So in those cases, they are referred with the solitary nodule. They are suspicious, but they are not sure. It could be granuloma. Patient may have had a previous TB, or it could be just a fibrosis with scarring. So if the pet is hot, that's easy, you say it's likely to be, but if it is low grade uptake, then you are stuck. Now you need to say whether this is benign or this is malignant, which is a very difficult choice to make. And I think at that moment in time, it is just a twist of a coin. It's 50-50. So it depends how you phrase your conclusion, so how you want to phrase it. Normally when I Probably we'll see we'll see some uh, cases then uh, we can discuss. So, uh, yes, depends. So if you, no, no. So we didn't talk about. So look at the low risk and depends on the size of the nodule. Yes, yes. So basically, I've said three nine or nothing is basically depending on the size of the nodule. Here? Yes. yes, if it is a solitary nodule, 
but it's low risk then you don't need if the serial CTs after three months or 12 months if it is stable then you don't need it's basically it's the cost you're looking at yes you can it depends sometimes you know they don't want to go through they say oh let's do a pet if pet is negative but then again if pet is negative it doesn't rule out malignancy yeah so we'll go through probably just remind me when we are uh, looking at the cases so just remind me to differentiate how you differentiate between the benign and malignant so single uh, pulmonary nodule 30 to 50 percent are malignant chest x-ray and ct not accurate in differentiating benign from malignant morphology stability over two years reflects benignity doubling time of malignant nodules is 30 to 400 days and doubling time in volume is 20 percent increase in diameter is abnormal yeah so false positive and false negative so you've got a spectrum of false positive granulomas sarcoidosis this is a very common norm you see and this granulomas you can see for a, a range of uptake on PET and it confuses the whole thing. Infection is another one, adenomas, hematomas, neurofibromas. This is now very common and people have started identifying these. This used to be bronchoalveolar carcinoma, now the terminology has changed and is known as low-grade adenocarcinoma, slow-growing adenocarcinoma. Scar adenocarcinoma, so we do quite a few when this patient has got apical scarring or scarring and there is a soft tissue developing within the scar. So they want to characterize this, they send it for uh, uh, FDG and if it is FDG positive then they say we can say that this is possible scar carcinoma developing. Carcinoid again goes side by side with bronchoalveolar carcinoma. So it's whenever I'm reporting I report these two together as a caveat that we cannot differentiate carcinoid from bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Well differentiated, so again looking at, if you look at the carcinoid uh, neuroendocrine tumors, you've got a spectrum of well differentiated to poorly differentiated. So the spectrum from left to right, gallium positive, PET positive, same here. If it is well differentiated, a slow growing tumor, it may be PET negative. And mucinous carcinoma. So there's this meta-analysis of 40 studies which shows 1,474 focal pulmonary lesions. The sensitivity of PET was 96%, but the specificity was 78%. So still, it's not good enough, but it's reasonable. But sensitivity is there, because if it is PET avid, but you don't know whether this is tumor or not. Yeah. FDG. What's that? Dual point. Yes, uh, it does. Uh, I think uh, we, I, in PET-MR, I've shown that, and there are a lot of literatures in dual point imaging that if you compare the SUVs, which I did, and uh, it shows over time, this is pathophysiology going back, and uh, you know that if there is a tumor, there'll be washout. So people say whether it is because of the washout, you have got better contrast and you have got better uptake. Some people say because this is tumor, so it's localizing more FDG, taking up FDG over time, so if you delay, uh, your scanning, you may see more activity. With prostate, with cholines, we started doing those and we, our acquisition parameters were 60 minutes and we used to do 90 minutes uh, section. But because of the throughput, more patients coming through, we couldn't uh, accommodate to uh, two times. So now I've changed the protocol and we started doing at 90 minutes. Because at 90 minutes you've got better contrast resolution. And the other thing is, if you are looking at sarcomas, there are guidelines, not guidelines, but there are literature saying that if you do a delayed scan, the sensitivity of picking up uh, 
sarcomatous transformation changes in, in sarcoma as uh, malignant increases significantly. So it's important, but nobody knows. It's been reported in all uh, papers. Is if you delay the images. Still, we, we don't follow it. We do it 60 minutes. So, diagnostic accuracy of FDG PET and CT for characterization. 344 patients, definite diagnosis made, average size 1.6 millimeters. Sensitivity of PET was 91%, CT was 95%, and 82% and specificity. You see, when you're talking about the sensitivity, you can always see a lesion, yeah? So it's in the range of 90s. But when you want to say this is malignant, so look at the difference. So this is again a meta-analysis. It's just for your reference, just to say where you stand and, uh, you know. So this looked into the dynamic CT, dynamic MRI, FDG PET, and deptotide. So the sensitivity of this was all in 90s. And then sensitivity was 76, 79, and FDG was 82, similar to deprotide. So this is a 63-year-old 8-millimeter nodule for evaluation. That's a well-defined nodule, peripherally based. This is how I would describe and uh, this is most likely to be the inferior lobe. So what would you say? Thoughts? So this is the pet. So your conclusion? How will you uh, write your report in your uh, conclusion. You will put your word as benign. Benign. Okay. There is nothing there, so we thought it uh, could be coming from. Uh, yeah, there is nothing there. So I would be a bit wary about uh, this, although it looks benign, but we have been caught so many times and we stopped using benign. So I would basically say this, uh, the appearances are not very sinister, but uh, the adenocarcinoma, and this is peripheral and well-rounded uh, carcin uh, carcinoid. And uh, I would basically, if in peripheral, so if they are con concerned, they can biopsy it or they follow it up as per protocol. You can't say anything more. So this is uh, non-small cell lung cancer staging. <coughs> so I don't want to go into this. So it's based on the size. So T1, T2, T3 is again change, and I haven't put a new one now and T4 invasion of the edges and organ. End staging is ipsilateral hyla, ipsilateral mediastinal, and subcranial is N2, and contralateral sclerini and supraclavicular. M0 and M1 is uh, no metastasis, distant metastasis. If you have got nodules in different segments, then it becomes M1. So if you've got a lesion in the upper lobe and you've got a contralateral lung nodule, which is also, it could be M1, or it could be a synchronous secondary tumor. This is the nodal classification. So, again, so we have discussed all this. So that's the, I haven't told you, this is the infrapulmonary ligament. So it's just at the infrapulmonary ligament. These are nodules. This is the aorta. And this, you can say, infrahyla, just at the level of the pulmonary ligament. <laughs> On the CT, you normally don't see it, but uh, if you come down from the hilum down, and then uh, this is, it's very difficult uh, to mention, but this is a space. So 
just above the pulmonary ligament because this is the hilum coming through and at the inferior margin of the hilum where the hilum is, you see this ligament. You can say it depends, right paraiotic, right paratracheal below the right hilum. Or to be more specific, then if you put a cursor here, put a sagittal and say right paraiotic at the level of T3, T4 or whatever. So to be more precise. No. So, looking at this staging, stage one, two, three A and three B, no nodes or mets is stage one, 40% five year survival. Stage two, regional nodes, T1 and N1, 20%. So it's very important how you stage the disease. And stage three A, is 15% five year survival and stage 3B, five years, five percent, five year survival, 40% one year survival. But things are changing because of the different management and better techniques. So PET for TNM staging, accurate staging is, per, in, is paramount for management, invasive diagnostic procedures sometimes necessary, where it's inconclusive and uh, indeterminate. CT and MRI demonstrate real relationship to edges in organ detection of nodules and limited by size. We have just published a paper uh, comparing the PET CT and PET MR, whether it makes any difference in characterizing uh, lesions, and we have shown that it does not, even though we are still evolving in the MR protocols to improve and make it equivalent to CT, which is still very difficult. But detection and uh, Diagnosing is, uh, it has got similar sensitivity and specificity. FDG PET T staging limited by poor anatomical resolution detect tumor well in subcentimeter nodes and whole body detects unsuspected metastases. So, 77 year old male right hyla mass. Did you see anything? So, Fusion, probably atelectasis. I can't see anything here. So you see something there. So what would you say? So this is def definitely tumor with uh, probably at the uh, aortopulmonary window or the prevascular region. Yeah. So this is not a problem. Yeah. So again, looking at the meta-analysis for PET and PET CT, 14 studies, 514 patients, sensitivity 79 and 60 percent on CT, and 91 and 77 percent. And prospective study for PET and CT in 102 patients looking at the FDG and CT, 79 and 91. So PET has over, always overplayed the CT. So it is basically part and parcel, and it takes the lead as the uh, in uh, lung nodules and staging of uh, disease. And PET, they looked at the management, so they changed uh, staging in 60% uh, of patients is quite a lot. So common size of metastases, adrenal, skeletal, liver, and brain. FDG proved superior, detect unsuspected distant metastases in 13%, change management in 18%. This is another study by Peterman. So you've got lung cancer. So you, it's difficult on the so you don't see it, you see the PET, you see some lesion there, cavitating lesion, nodules there, and then you see uptake. Most of the time you see uptake in the vocal cord, you just disregard it and you ignore it. But sometimes you need to look at it, you can say it's physiological, but then you go back and look at it and look at the asymmetry. 
This is most commonly you seen at the arytenocricoid uh, cartilage, it's a synovial joint, and it can have arthritis. So you see some, most of the time focal uptake there, intense uptake. But if you see asymmetry, and sometimes I've reported this, if the, the vocal cord is adducted, lying in the midline, is paralyzed, thickened, so it's most likely representing there is some obstruction which is causing this uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis. So if you see that, then the most common site to go down all the way to the aortic arch and look at whether there is any tumor sitting on and impinging on the recurrent, because recurrent laryngeal nerve comes down, reflects on the aortic arch, goes back up into the neck, and then supplies the vocal cord. So paralysis of the vocal cord always go down. Don't look for anything in the head and neck first. Go down and then look at it at that region. No, this is abnormal. So, yeah, it doesn't. It's a it's a metastatic metastatic. Yeah, so it doesn't matter where metastasis go. It doesn't refer, show that it's going to go on to the right side. If the tumor is on the right side, it can go anywhere. No, no, it's not recurrent, it's metastasis. Because this is too high tumor, so I'm talking about which, if the tumor is lower down. So this is another study, 1,000 patients, oncology patients, unsuspected metastasis were found in only 0.4%, and in 110 patients, 43 patients with metastasis, 21 patients had bone metastasis. And the specificity was 95%. So, Again, this one, there's a nodule there. You can't see anything here, and you can't see anything probably just a sclerotic area there. And then, looking at this, there is uptake on the fused data, and then there's a bone mats, and on this, there is this bone mats. So on CT, sometimes it becomes very difficult to appreciate, but if you look at the PET, it gives you an outlay of what is the abnormal pathology, and then you target those areas, and then you characterize them further. Small cell lung cancer is a neuroendocrine aggressive tumor. So this basically separates from the non-small cell. So it follows the pattern of neuroendocrine tumors. And if you do a PET, then probably PET is more very sensitive. And this is, this is the, another tumor I've seen which behaves exactly like uh, melanoma. If you're looking at small cell lung cancer, it can go anywhere. It can metastasize anywhere, and you will see areas which are, you know, metastatic, and you will not expect them normally. Same with melanoma. Melanoma metastasize anywhere within the stomach, from stomach uh, to the intraorbital region, and within the globe. So these are very dangerous tumors, very aggressive tumors. So we can use uh, PET as a radiotherapy planning. So it's a tumor, central tumor, causing distal atelectasis and collapse. So probably it's involving the right bronchus, maybe causing narrowing, probably causing obstruction and distal lung changes. So looking at this, if you're looking at the CT only, it becomes very difficult because you just go up and down and you can miss a lesion. So if you just compare the two sides, you see the fat density, which is lost, even the cortices are intact. It's very subtle on CT. Some, most of the time you ignore if you're just looking at CT. This is metastases. 1.4 centimeter nodule, lung nodule. So how would you describe this nodule? Sorry? The margins are well defined. Well defined. So what is 1.4 centimeters, 47 years old female. So your suspicions are high or low. So what Gopi asked, so this 
feature is very suggestive of malignancy. It's ill-defined, speculated. It's not, you know, it's not uh, at this moment in time causing any parenchymal destruction, but as it goes along, it causes destruction and it becomes more ill-defined and speculated, and you see puckering of the parenchyma. So it's hot, 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 and lung changes are there. There is no evidence of metastases, and management will be Yeah, good. 44-year-old female, indeterminate 1.5 centimeter lung nodule. You'll order pets. What would you do? Because you can't differentiate. Yeah, good. Similar patient. So it's just a spectrum, I and mean, this is a confirm, this is the one I'm showing. So if you go back, you know, exactly the same, and this is confirmed on histology, and it turned out to be bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Now, people have now, since they have identified before, they used to ignore. It is amazing to look at the CT now and go back and you say, how many times I've missed it. Anything which is ground glass, it raises a suspicion. Normally, we used to say, oh, there is ground glass and it's infection. But now, people are quite wary about calling it uh, ground glass infection. And if I, I see, I basically, when I'm reporting, I sometimes look at the CT, and they've been reported by the chest specialist, radiologist, and uh, it's amazing the way they have changed their uh, reporting. And they will put a caveat saying bronchoalveolar carcinoma in most of the reports where there is ground glass. But saying that, Bronchoalveolar carcinoma has got very peculiar appearance most of the time. It could be just a haziness and it could be early bronchial, but bronchoalveolar carcinoma by definition will have ground glass appearance and it will have dilated bronchi within it. And bronchi and is surrounded by uh, ground glass. If you have that, got that appearance, then it is, not, it is less likely to be a benign focal bronchiectasis infection, it could be, but you need to make them aware that it could be a bronchoalveolar carcinoma, which is slow growing and needs follow-up or treatment or biopsy. So probably a nodule. So on the basis of this, you would say, I don't know, it's too small, it is a benign so that's what the significance of a solitary pulmonary nodule, and these are the guidelines that uh, you need a PET before biopsy. So this one is hot, hot, and the features on CT are not typical of malignancy. That's why they requested, they were not sure. So it shows some changes, probably the breasts and these uh, lung changes and this was a carcinoid. So you can't, you know, that's what I keep saying, and I, in the meetings I say it's very difficult 
when they ask, they say, is it cancer or this is not cancer, what it is, I just tell them I'm not a pathologist, I'm a radiologist, and I can tell you what the appearances are and where the, you know, tumor is. So location, and on the basis of location, you know, it may be a chest lung nodule cancer, or it can be a gastric tumor, or a bowel, bowel tumor, or bone tumor. But you can't give them a histology. You can say it's malignant, suspicious, or not. Previous colorectal cancer presented with lung masses. This is a problem when uh, I have, and uh, I was reporting recently, I had uh, a left lung diffuse uptake, pleural uptake, multiple nodules in the lung, uh, pleura, and the question was, there is a very speculated uh, nodule in the left upper lobe with diffuse pleural uptake and pleural nodules, and on the contralateral side there were small nodules which have marginally increased in size over a period of time. When you're reporting this, that is a dilemma. You can report there are two nodules, mild uptake, one nodule, speculated uptake, plural uptake with nodules, full stop. Well, it takes two minutes. Now, what are you going to say? Which one? Because he's asking you which one is cancer and which one is... So, I basically said the left upper lobe is speculated, showing uptake slightly more than the other side. This one, I would put first line, suspicious. Then I said, what should I say? Because the appearances of the crudal uptake, and there was no history. So it's just increase in size of the two nodules, question mark, Malik, this was the history. So I was making history on my assumptions, and I was putting those assumptions into my conclusions. So saw this, I was looking at the pet yesterday, and there was in your center here, there was this again, this uh, plural effusion and plural uptake, volume reduction in the hemithorax. So I, I didn't look at the report, but my impression went what I was thinking of my report, and I was thinking of how the person at this end would be reporting this. So basically I said this is uh, plural uptake, no history is there. So question mark, you know, in the absence of uh, pre previous pleurodesis, because pleurodesis will have exactly the same. So you need to rule out mesothelioma. If there is a history of pleurodesis, then it goes with pleurodesis. You don't have to do anything. Now going on to the other side, I said, I don't know. On the basis of that, and the uptake and the appearances are suggestive of uh, benignity. However, I cannot rule out if there is a primary, this could be metastasis, or it could be metastasis from there. So, a follow. Do you feel you have a primary It's possible. It's very unusual. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So, I don't know. So, this could be, but the appearances were, and the uptake was 2.5, but there was uptake. So, and uh, one of the nodules was plurally based, so I said this one is probably less likely. The other one was more central. So, you know, it's these are the ones which becomes difficult. So, what would you say about this? So, they've got multiple nodules and lung mass. I should have given you a lung window as well, so... so. Would you have called that? No. I would basically, it's uh, said atelectasis, but on the basis of this, I would say it's around atelectasis towards the base, and this needs a follow-up. Definitely this needs a follow-up, or if you are brave enough to put a needle in and uh, biopsy this point. But you can sometimes overshoot and it can be non-diagnostic. So it's around atelectasis, you cannot differentiate whether there is a mass growing in, and this definitely needs a follow-up, and if it doesn't increase, then just disregard it. Yes, that basically, it's actually like an infection, so it can, basically, you can't differentiate one from the other. Uh, 
It's, uh, when I started uh, reporting PET, I used to mention, and then one of my colleagues who does cardiacs only, he said this one is so variable. So it depends what the uptakes are, what the sugar levels are, what is the phase. I started reporting uh, infarctions on uh, PET. Then I said I'm maybe over calling. Could there be human? I mean, human yes, I have got quite a few examples. Recently we had one with uh, 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 metastases and uh, myxomas, you can see, atrial myxomas. So it would be a possible, but then you, you've got the CT to look at. Yes, because the, by definition, this is typical. This is basically atelectasis, round atelectasis has got a very typical definition. So you've got a triangular base opacity, which has got the broad base towards the pleura and the apex gumming towards the parenchyma. And into that, you've got a claw sign. So you've got a pulmonary art vessel and the bronchus going into it. So when you see that on CT, then it's atelectasis. But the question becomes, when it's round atelectasis, whether there is a mass in it which could be malignant. So that, for that reason, you need, sometimes you just see the bronchus and collapse is linear atelectasis. When it becomes round atelectasis, it becomes difficult. And what you ask, uh, plural based nodules, you should be aware because you've got uh, uh, lung lymph nodes. So if you see within two millimeters of the pleura, not use, I'm not that confident because I don't do, I'm not a lung uh, radiologist, but I can say most likely, if you see rounded oblong shape or bean shape uh, nodes, then you say, and it is within two millimeters of the uh, pleura, then you say it's most likely lymph nodes. So this patient had uh, primary sarcoidosis, question mark, lung changes, opacity. That's sarcoidosis. The conclusion, differentiate benign versus malignant PET, monitor response, early response. So that is now people have started using, especially in lung, breast. I mean, US, they use, in UK, we don't use uh, PET as a response. Only we use PET for breast for metastatic diseases. Good predictor of prognosis and planning radiotherapy detecting unsuspected metastases and potential role in small cell lung cancer and mesothelioma. Thank you.